The story begins as a hero steps in to save a little girl from being swarmed by a horde of goblins, and she can't help but admire his courage. Some years later, Laos the hero goes to the Adventurer's Guild to take up a quest. When a lady asks him for a team-up, other adventurers in the guild are stunned by the girl's action. The girl offers to team up with Laust after seeing his sign asking for recruits to join his party. She introduces herself as Narsina, telling Laust she's a skilled martial artist while Laust introduces himself and tells her he's a healer but he still doubts his ability. Amherst, an employee of the guild suddenly cuts into their conversation, asking Narsina if she knows Laust's identity. She informs her that Laust is an incompetent healer who only knows the most basic spells despite growing up as an adventurer. She informs Narsina that Laust is a loser because despite his years of being an adventurer he's yet to learn any advanced healing spells. She informs Narsina that Laust was recently kicked out of his previous party because he couldn't use a detoxification spell to save his party members. Everyone in the town knew about Laust's incompetent, giving them a reason to ignore his recruitment posters. Amherst tells Narsina she will run out of money if she teams up with Laust because he doesn't get paid since he can't complete quests as a healer. Narsina shows Amherst her purse, assuring her that she will be fine because she is well off. Amherst warns Narsina not to walk around with such a huge bag of money because most of the adventurer is in the town are gangsters and they will prey on her. Narsina thanks Amherst for the advice, but Amherst offers to help her get into a beginner party after figuring out that she just started as an adventurer. Amherst asks for small handling fee to help Narsina mediate the process, but Narsina turns her down because she's set on teaming up with Laust. Amherst can't understand why Narsina is resolved to team up with Laust, but she obliges her request. She hands them a party application form, telling them to keep it handy so they can always refer to it in case of a dispute. While Laust is filling out the form, Narsina keeps admiring him glad to have finally met her hero from the past. Laust asks her to write her name on the form and she gladly does so. After they fill out the form, Amherst demands the handling fee from Laust, who reluctantly takes out some money from his little coin pouch. Amherst gladly accepts the fee as Narsina is excited to be in the same party as her hero. They leave the guild as Laust goes over the details of the Mardat Labyrinth. No one has yet to explore its deepest parts so there is no information about the kind of monster the master of the labyrinth is. Many adventurers were curious about the labyrinth, making the Mardat its largest city as they head to the labyrinth. Narsina wonders if they are qualified to explore it, since they newly formed parties this recounts Amherst's warning, telling them they can only explore the grasslands of the west since Narsina is still a novice. Laos knew that Amherst's advice was reasonable because the monsters in the grasslands to the west were the weakest compared to the other locations around the city. It is a befitting place for beginners to start their adventuring, but Laos tells Narsina the grassland is so massive that monsters rarely appear. He tells her there are more monsters in the labyrinth assuring her they won't be harmed so long as they don't venture too deeply into it, Laos assurances convince Narsina. They arrive at the labyrinth entrance and are about to enter when Narsina cuts Laos off. She tells him she needs to take the lead because she's a martial artist and he's a healer. Laos agreed with her because she made a logical suggestion. Narsina leads the way and Laos follows behind her, marveling at her youthful enthusiasm. They enter the labyrinth and though Laos is glad that Narsina is so motivated, he wonders if her combat skills match her enthusiasm. They suddenly encounter monsters in the labyrinth and Narsina immediately takes them down. She takes down the goblins so easily, trying to show off her strength to impress Laos, who commends her for being strong. Narsina gladly takes in his praises glad to be useful to her hero. The monsters drop an item which Laust and show off to Narsina, he tells her adventurers make a living by selling monster drops like the magic stone to the guild. Narsina wonders why the magic stone is so valuable to the guild and he tells her they make use of the magic which resides in the magic stone. Laust teases Narsina for knowing little about adventuring despite claiming to be an adventurer, Narsina confesses that she's not very good at studying because she would rather have a practical approach. They gather the magic stones together and Narsina wonders how much she can get from selling them, but Laos tells her they aren't worth much because they are drops from goblins. He tells her the only way to get more valuable stones is to defeat more powerful monsters in the labyrinth. Laos was content with the drops they had gotten because it was enough to pay the bills for that day. He asks Narsina if she wants to explore the labyrinth further and she enthusiastically answers, telling him she wants to go further. She promises to protect him in an emergency, assuring him that no harm will come to him. Her answer convinces Laos so they keep exploring the labyrinth. 
They are walking down the labyrinth corridors when Laos suddenly pulls Narcina back. Narcina is so surprised that she wonders what happens so Laos points at the labyrinth floor. He demonstrates that the floor was booby-trapped and Narcina is impressed. He figured out it was a trap. He points out that the color of the floor was different and Narcina tells him she didn't notice. She wonders how a healer was able to find a trap which is supposed to be a thief's job and Laos tells her it's from the experience he's gotten from working for a long time. They keep exploring the labyrinth and crouch down to avoid being seen when by a patrolling half-orc, Laos wonders why a mid-level monster is in the upper level of the labyrinth because it is unusual for them to appear there. Narcina suggests that they turn tail and run away since the monster outclasses them, but Laos assures her they stand a chance against it if they combine forces. Narcina agrees to battle the monster so they come out to face it. Narcina rushes at the monster who takes a swing at her, but she dodges. She jumps into the air and lands a kick on the monster, hurting her legs because the monster's skin feels like a brick wall. The monster raises its club to attack again and Narcina takes advantage of its slow movements. She dodges the monster's attack but gets distracted by some flying debris that scratches her. The monster attacks again and she blocks it just in time to avoid taking damage, but the monster corners her. The monster attacks, swings its club once again, certain it's going to get a guarantee hit and Narcina accepts her defeat but Laos steps in to save her. Laos defeats the monster with his sword triggering memories of when he saved her several years ago. Narcina wonders if Laos is just a healer and tells her he has acquired many other skills because he has been an adventurer for a long time. Narcina is impressed by his variety of skills but Laos suddenly notices that she's injured. Narcina tells him not to worry about it because it's a scratch that will heal in no time, but Laos tells her even the smallest scratches need proper treatment, he tends to her wound healing it immediately. They go for the drop from the half-orc and Narcina is impressed by how much bigger the monster's magic stone is compared to that of the goblins. Laos is glad the magic stone will fetch a good price because it has a high magic content, he asks Narcina what she wants to do next, suggesting that they go back since they've gotten so many magic stones, but Narcina tells him she's still capable of fighting. They decide to keep hunting monsters while Narcina is still bursting with energy. After their exploration, they return to the guild with the magic stones and Amherst is surprised they defeated so many monsters in just half a day. She realizes that Laos took Narcina to the labyrinth instead of taking her to the grasslands as suggested. She scolds Laos for taking Narcina to the middle level of the labyrinth because it's the only way to get a half-orc magic stone, but Laos tells her they only explored the upper levels. Narcina backs him up, telling Amherst that Laos didn't let her explore the labyrinth further than the upper level despite insisting on it. Amherst is convinced that Laos is innocent, so she gladly accepts the magic stones and joyfully goes to the back to sort out their payment. Narcina wonders why Amherst is so happy in Laos, tells her the guild employees get a raise when they turn in the magic stones returned by the adventurers they are responsible for. Amherst sweet talks Narcina into working harder to obtain more magic stones so they can always get a raise at the guild, she hands Laos their payment and Laos is surprised by how much they get from a single expedition. Laos still can't believe he gets so much money from the magic stones because the payment is ten times what he has ever made even if he splits it in half and gives Narcina her share, it suddenly dawns on him that his former party ripped him off heavily. Amherst points this out to Narcina who is furious, reminding Amherst that she was supposed to help settle monetary disputes between party members. Amherst tells her they can intervene if Laos pays the fee but Laos decides to let things go because he now has a new party, he decides to forget the past and focus on his new party. They leave the guild but Han Sam, the guild master walks out of his room and silently observes as they go. Amherst gleefully takes inventory of the magic stones in her possession when Han Sam suddenly walks in on her, he asks her if she helped Laos find a new party and she tells him she can't sweet talk anyone into teaming up with Laos because everyone knows he's a fraud. She informs him that Narcina decided to team up with Laos because she felt a special connection to him. Han Sam gets a description of Narcina from Amherst and leaves her to her magic stones. Laos and Narcina walk into an inn and the waiter greets them. The waiter recognizes Narcina as Laos' new party member and Laos is surprised that news of his partnership with Narcina has already spread all over the city. The waiter tells him everyone was surprised that someone as incompetent as him was able to get a new party member. Laos shrugs off the blow to his reputation and makes a reservation for dinner and a room. Mary, the inn owner asks them if they will be sharing a room and Narcina looks forward to sharing a room with Laos, but he dashes her hopes by making a reservation for two rooms. Mary serves them dinner before showing them to their room and Laos thanks her for her service. 
They go into their separate rooms after exchanging good nights and Narcina slumps on her bed. Narcina recalls when Laos saved her when she was much younger. After Laos healed her wounds, Narcina swore to become an adventurer just like him and protect him in the future. From that day, she trained to become an adventurer, waiting for the day he would meet Laos again, she immediately traveled to the city after hearing that Laos had been kicked out of his previous party so she could form a party with him, she is content with how things turned out, and though she is happy that they were able to form a party and defeat monsters together. She is disappointed that Laos didn't recognize her, she figures out that Laos couldn't recognize her because her physical appearance has changed since she first met Laos some years prior. She realizes that Laos doesn't need her help because he has become much stronger than he was when they first met which makes her sad. She snaps out of her misery and encourages herself to continue what she has decided to do. She renews her resolve to protect Laos whatever the cost. She didn't want to conclude that she came to the city for nothing so she put her doubts behind her. She gets ready for bed, but something bothers her. She can't help but wonder why the townsfolk think Laos is so incompetent despite his overwhelming strength. The story continues, we see in the past when Laos was still part of Lightning Blade. The party was up against a Hydra and one party member has already been injured by it, so it was Laos' job to heal her while the party leader held off the monster. Unfortunately, while Laos was able to heal a physical injury, the woman was also poisoned so she asked if Laos could deal with the poison as well. Laos apologizes and tells her he can't actually get rid of the poison so the woman gets pissed because that means she has to recover by herself. The leader asked her to stop complaining and get back into the fight already because he can't keep the Hydra busy forever, but with the poison still in her system, the woman is in no condition to fight. The leader asks Laos to get her back in shape, but Laos says he can't do it and that they should have brought an antidote potion with them. The leader argues that he didn't buy one because antidotes are expensive and that's supposed to be Laos' job as a healer. Since Laust and Siberia aren't going to get much help for now, the leader turns to the mage and asks her to do something to help him because he can't handle the Hydra himself. So Armia tries using a flame spell but it does absolutely nothing against the Hydra, so she gets scared and drops her staff. Margulis is given up on his party's incompetence so he turns around and orders everyone to retreat immediately. Since Margulis gave up Armia breaks down and runs away as well followed by Laust and Siberia, who still can't walk so Laust is helping her. However, as they are leaving the Hydra Key to close eye on Laust for some reason. Once they got back to the guild, Margulis took great joy in telling Laust that he was being kicked out of the Lightning Blade party, and he justifies his decision by saying it's Laust's fault that they couldn't defeat the Hydra, but Laust doesn't think he's the only one to blame since both Margulis and Siberia were so excited to battle a Hydra that they stayed up all night and went into the fight sleep-deprived. The two of them refuse to accept any accountability for the failure, so they both look to Armia and tell her and decide who is at fault. Armia doesn't want to put the blame solely on Laust, but she also performed terribly during that battle, so she doesn't want Margulis targeting her instead for being useless, and thus she decides to throw Laust under the bus. Laust soon wakes up from his dream, and he realizes that he must still be bothered by what happened to him that day. Back before Laust during the Lightning Blade, he was already known as an idiot healer by everyone in town, although he still dreamed of becoming a first-rate adventurer. So when a party reached out to him with a position Laust was overjoyed and jumped at the opportunity. However, once they were in a labyrinth, Laust soon found out that they hadn't hired him because they wanted a healer, they hired him because they wanted a human sacrifice and distract the monsters. Laust was tossed out and forced to run for his life, while his so-called party members at the time tried to walk past him without a care in the world but all of a sudden, the monsters earned their attention away from Laust and began attacking the other party members instead, they into a total massacre. In the end, Laos was the only one who managed to survive and while he knows it is normal for a weak commoner like him to be treated this way, he still wished that someone would acknowledge him as a real adventurer. Just then, as he was walking home, came across a carriage that had been attacked by some goblins, and normally he wouldn't care enough to put himself in danger by helping but he saw how scared the little girl looked, so he threw caution to the wind and ran down to defend her, even though he was just a useless healer. He did his best to fight off the goblins, but he still sucked at combat back then so in a matter of minutes, Laos got knocked out by a club to the back of the head. Laos fully expected to die that day, but he eventually wakes up and finds the little girl standing over him. He wonders how he could possibly still be alive, but then he looks over and notices that the Knight's Order had shown up and defeated all the goblins. He went through all the effort of trying to act heroic but in the end, it looks like he's still an absolute idiot no matter what he does. 
However, despite the fact that he didn't do much, the girl still thanked him because his actions brought enough time for the knight's order to make it here and she thought it was really cool the way he jumped in to save her. Laos notice is a scratch on the girl's arm, so if he raises his hand to heal her injury and she's thankful for it, but Laos doesn't think he deserves any praise because low heal is the only thing he can actually do. The girl looks confused so Laos tells her all about his weakness and how he was just tricked into going into the labyrinth just so he could be used as bait, and she feels sorry that he had to go through such a thing. So she stands up and declares that she will become an adventurer in the future and form a party with him so she can protect Laos. Soon enough the girl left with the knight's order and by now Laos have pieced together that she was the daughter of a noble family, so he never believed she would actually become an adventurer or that he would ever meet her again, but nevertheless her words gave him courage. So he decided to continue doing his best to become a proper adventurer. He went on a journey and soon found himself a mentor, so under their instruction he began his training arc and worked tirelessly for countless hours to improve himself, and while as a healer he could still only use basic heal. He developed many other useful adventurer skills, so he was confident that he would no longer be a burden to anyone. And upon returning to pursue his adventurer dream the first party join was Lightning Blade, but we all know how that turned out, don't we? Still Laust is grateful to that girl, because if she hadn't said those kind words to him that day, probably would have quit being an adventurer once and for all that day. But it's not like he will ever get the chance to meet her again, and there's no way she would have actually become an adventurer like she said she would. Just then, Narcina knocks on his door so Laos goes to answer and she tells him she was thinking about going down to get some breakfast, so she wanted him to come with her and he happily agrees to after breakfast, they head down into the labyrinth again, and this time they are going for some of the lower floors. As they enter, Narcina spots an inscription in the ground and it looks like it's a teleportation circle, although she has never seen one in person before. Laust explains that you don't find teleportation circles in every labyrinth, and this one was probably put here by magicians soon after the labyrinth was discovered, although he doesn't have much information about it. Narcina asks if they can use this to teleport to different locations, and that's technically correct, but there still needs to be a teleportation circle on the other side to exit from. That sounds really convenient so Narcina wishes there was a teleportation circle installed in the city, so they didn't have to walk all the way out here, but the knowledge used to create these circles was lost hundreds of years ago, so there's no way to make new ones. They both step onto the teleportation circle and after a bright flash they appear on one of the lower floors. Laos tells Narcina that this is one of the mid-level floors so the monsters here are going to be a lot stronger than the goblins she fought yesterday and he wants her to be extra careful. Laust and Narcina begin fighting their way through the floor, but Narcina goes off on her own and tries to punch a lich, but Laust warns her against it. Liches are monsters made up of pure spirit energy, so physical attacks won't work on it. Laust suggests they fall back since they don't have anything that can damage the lich, but Narcina says she actually has a trick up her sleeve that she may be able to work against it. Laust decides to trust her so the two of them face off against the lich and Laust goes out in front to act as bait. He then starts running away and as the lich chases after him, he runs past Narcina who is preparing herself to take the lich down. All people possess a form of spirit energy within them called Ki, and as a martial artist, Narcina has training enough that she's able to control the Ki within her body and use it as a weapon by covering her fists with it. This way when she goes to attack the lich, she punches a hole straight through it and it soon disintegrates like any other monster and drops his magic stone. Laos runs over to check on her and she seems perfectly fine, aside from the wounds she got on her arm. Laos tells her to stay still for a second because he wants to try something so he pulls out a magic item that enhances the effects of healing spells and uses it to heal Narcina's wounds. They head back to the guild together to show Ambers the stones and she is shocked that they managed to defeat a lich, but she is also excited for the commission she will get from this sale. Laust and Narcina get a lot more money than they were expecting, so they are in a really good mood and start heading back to the inn, but along the way, they run into a fight going on in the middle of the street. Things like this have been becoming more common over the years as more and more outlaws move into town to become adventurers, and they've been given all the honest adventures of bad name. It's a real mess, but there's nothing Laust or Narcina can do to change it, so Laust suggests that they should just enjoy their money and have a fancy dinner tonight. A little while later, Laust and Narcina are seated at their table and then serve one of Mary's best dishes to eat. While they eat Narcina says she has a question she's been meaning to ask, so she points out to the giant stone pillar on the edge of town and asks what that thing is. At first she thought it was a building but it has no windows or doors and it doesn't look like a monument either so it's really confusing. Laust shares were confusion and explains that he doesn't know what is either. 
He once got curious about it and asked one of the workers about it while it was still being constructed, but the workers didn't know what it was for, or who was paying to have it built. Narsina can't believe something like that was possible, but apparently an agent just showed up one day with some money and blueprints so no one ever met the funder. Still, as strange as it may seem, Laos just chalks it up to some billionaire doing random shit and he's perfectly fine with that since the towers aren't actually hurting anyone, but he also wishes some of that money could have gone towards building a wall for the city since it doesn't have one. Narsina agrees that a wall for the city would be nice, but at the same time she doesn't think there's much to worry about since with the number of adventurers that live in this city, whether it is monsters or thieves that attack, she's sure it'll be able to fight off any threats. After dinner, they both head back to their room but before Laos goes to bed for the night, Narsina calls him back. She clearly has something to say but she can't bring herself to see it, so she just tells him good night and heads to bed. Inside her room, she jumps on her bed and is upset because she wanted to tell Laos that she won't stay to in the same room as him, but she couldn't come out and say it because it was too embarrassing. In the other room, Laos is lying in bed with his mind at ease now that he has such a great party member, he was able to continue adventuring thanks to that little girl's motivation, and while he doesn't know if he will ever get to meet her again he has a lot to thank Narsina for. In other news, Margulis has just found a new member for the Lightning Blade party and while he seems really excited to have Lyra join the team, Siberia doesn't seem to like her very much and Armia is too shy to make direct eye contact. Anyway, now that the team is complete again, Margulis is eager to head out and finally defeat that Hydra once for all. The story continues, we see the Lightning Blade party heads back to the swamp to confront the Hydra and luckily, the Hydra hasn't grown its head back yet, so they won't have to do as much work. Margulis quickly comes up with a plan of attack and says he and Lyra will attack from the front Armia will provide magic support and Siberia will seek out from behind. He's just about ready to run out into the action, but Lyra calls a timeout because there's no way she can be on the front line of an attack as a healer. Margulis is confused because Laos always fought on the front lines with them and Lyra can't believe they were forcing their former to fight out on the front lines, but Laos never seemed to mind. In fact, Siberia recalls that Laos sometimes got some really good hits in and he was actually the one who cut one of the Hydra's heads off. Lyra is in disbelief after hearing this, but Margulis doesn't expect her to do something like that. If she says she can't fight on the front lines he's fine with that, but to make sure he asks her if she is capable of casting the detoxified spell to counter the Hydra's poison and that's something she can actually do, so Margulis tells everyone to get into position to slay the Hydra today. Back in town, Laust and Narsina have just returned from their latest trip into the labyrinth and Amherst is glad to see that they've brought more gems to sell to her, but she reminds Laos that he shouldn't push Narsina too far because she is still only a new adventurer, so Laust assures her that he's being very careful about the fights they get into. Amherst is glad to hear that they're being cautious, but there's still a limit to how much can be done with a party of two, so she suggests that Laust and Narsina should think about recruiting some new party members to make things easier for them. Laust agrees that more party members would make things easier but ultimately, he decides that it isn't worth the hassle since he and Narsina are already making a lot of money as they are. Amherst admits that he's right since with the amount they've been making recently, they could probably rent a house instead of staying in an inn if they wanted to. Narsina had no idea it was possible to rent a house in the city, so Amherst explains that there's a limit to the amount of equipment and items that you can store in an inn but that's not an issue when you have a private room, although it's quite expensive, but the real value shines when there's a male and female party, so the extra privacy allows for a lot of late night activity. Narsina suddenly seems really interested in renting a private house for some reason but seeing as Laos did not react, Amherst doubts late night activity is a possibility in this case. Speaking of private houses, Laos recalls that Lightning Blade had a private house as well, although they forced him to sleep in the storage closet, so it wasn't very comfortable for him. Amherst laughs how badly Laos was getting mistreated, but if it makes him feel better, she lets him know that he was actually pretty lucky to have been banished from Lightning Blade. Ever since he was kicked out, Margulis and the rest of Lightning Blade haven't been able to accomplish a single mission. Margulis can understand why but Lyra can clearly tell that he's too dumb to realize he isn't strong enough to handle a Hydra head-on. Margulis hears her, so he's about to start yelling again, but Lyra tells him to be quiet, otherwise she can't concentrate on helping Armia recover. Armia was badly injured and poisoned, so Lyra really does need to concentrate and while she's doing that, Siberia tells Margulis that as much as she hates to admit it Laust may have been more valuable than they gave him credit for, even though he stuck to healing, he was still able to get the job done in the end and he also didn't notice that they were scamming him out of his money, so he was the perfect party member. 
Margulis is really wishing Laos hadn't quit, but Siberia reminds him that he was actually the one who kicked Laos out of the party, and he made a big show of it too. Margulis had totally forgotten all about that, but if he was the one who kicked Laos out then he thinks it should be easy to get him back. All I have to do is ask and he is sure Laos will rejoin the party immediately because after all they're the famous Blades of Lightning, so no one would turn down an invitation to join the party, although Siberia is starting to question if she even wants to stay in the party at this point. By the next morning, Lyra is finally done healing Armia, so she wakes up and thanks her for the healing but Lyra is just happy she could help. She asked if Armia feels well enough to eat and since she does, Lyra heads downstairs to get some food for her, but when heads downstairs to ask where the food is stored she realizes Siberia and Margulis are gone and she has no idea where they went. Margulis and Siberia are currently the guild, and Margulis loudly proclaims that he is willing to graciously allow Laos to return to his party. Once again, everyone stops what they are doing and stares in disbelief and Laos is most shocked of all, so he asks Margulis to repeat himself because there's no way he could actually said something so dumb. Margulis repeats himself and Laos' ears weren't deceiving him, but he still doesn't know how to respond or such a ridiculous request. At the same time, Narsina and Amherst see what's going on and Amherst explains the blonde guy is the leader of the party that kicked Laos out and now he's trying to get to come back by acting condescending. Laos obviously isn't amused with Margulis's speech, but before he can say anything Margulis assumes he might be upset about the fact that they scammed him out of his pay while he was in their party, so Margulis apologizes and acts like it was an honest accident. He promises that Laos will get a fair share this time around plus they could really use his help since the new healer Margulis hired isn't very useful in combat. Siberia thinks there's no way Laos will actually agree to Margulis' request, but to her shock, Laos actually thanks Margulis for the offer. Narsina refuses to let Laos be stolen from her, so she runs out in front of him and starts yelling at Margulis saying Laos will never join his party again. Laos touches her shoulder and tells Narsina that she doesn't need to worry about him leaving after which he turns to Margulis and tells him that he was only saying thanks to be polite, but he has no interest in ever joining his party again. Margulis can't believe he got turned down and so if he starts getting desperate and accuses Narsina of trying to use Laos because she realized he is actually really useful to have around. All Margulis's aggressive pointing is starting to get on Laos' nerves so he grabs Margulis' hand and warns him that if he ever does anything to hurt Narsina, Laos will make sure his body will be mangled beyond recognition. Laos then turns to leave and Narsina pauses for a second to rub it in Margulis's face one last time. After they've left, Margulis doesn't know what to do, but he still wants to defeat the Hydra so he yells at Amherst to recommend him a new adventurer for his party, preferably one who can handle fighting on the front lines alongside him, and Amherst really doesn't want to have to deal with him, but it looks like she won't have to because an adventurer walks out from the crowd. And this dude looks like he completed all the side quests before coming here. The mysterious man offers to join his party and asks if Margulis is satisfied with his level of strength. Margulis checks the guy out and he definitely looks strong but to make sure, he's going to have to test his sword skills. He draws his sword and charges at the man but with a simple swing of his sword, the man instantly disarms Margulis and makes him look stupid in front of the entire guild. After recovering from the embarrassment, Margulis says he will accept the man into his party. However, Siberia doesn't think it's a good idea to trust a man who wears a mask all the time but Margulis says they have no choice because if they don't defeat the Hydra Lightning Blade reputation as a strong party will sink like a rock so he walks out to the guy and asks for his name so the guy tells in his name the Sikh. Back at Laust and Narsina's inn, Narsina is checking herself in the mirror when she hears someone knocking on Laust's door so she goes out to check who it is and finds Sheila at Laust's door. For some reason, her first thought is that Sheila is trying to make a move on Laust, but after thinking about it for a bit, she realizes that couldn't be possible. Once Laust finally opens the door, Sheila informs him that he has guests waiting for him downstairs, which is surprising but Laust decides to go meet with them to see what this is about. Once he gets downstairs, Laust and Narsina meet with Armia and Lyra, and while Armia feels bad for coming at him with such a brazen request, she asks Laust if he could come and help them just this once. Margulis still intends to go after that Hydra and even hire a new warrior to help with the mission, but Lyra doesn't think it's going to be enough to win. For one thing, Margulis is still too stubborn to buy an antidote potion because it costs money and he's never going to realize how reckless he's being until someone ends up dying because of him. Armia knows it's too late to apologize now, but she acknowledges how strong Laust is because if he hadn't cut off the Hydra's head last time they fought it, the entire party would have been wiped out. 
Laos still doesn't think he did all that much, but Lyra points out that the party struggled to survive against the Hydra that have lost two heads already, so they would have been dead meat if it was in perfect condition. Laust asks what exactly Armia is asking him to do, so Armia stands up and says she wants Laos to fight with them because she's sure they can defeat the Hydra if he is there as well. She's basically asking him to rejoin Lightning Blade, but Laust already had this conversation with Margulis earlier today and his answer remains the same. Narcina wonders why Armia seems so determined to help Margulis out since this whole odd party must be horrible for her to deal with. And yes, Armia believes Margulis has a lot of flaws and I mean a lot even so, he's still her party member. Narcina becomes angry after hearing this because Laust was her party member as well, but she did absolutely nothing to support him when he was being mistreated. Armia begins crying and apologizes for what she did to Laust, but at the time she was scared that if she didn't go along with what Margulis said she would be kicked out of the party as well. She's a new adventurer so she doesn't know any other parties to go to, but she now realizes that what she did was wrong and that Margulis is wrong for the way he treated Laust, but even though she doesn't agree with Margulis's way of doing things, she still doesn't want him to get himself killed in an unwinnable battle. Lyra tells Laos that Armia is serious about her apology and she's been agonizing over it for a long time, so while she understands Laos can decline the request, she asks that he at least consider accepting Armia's apology. Laos gets up and tells Armia that he holds no grudge against her so he will accept her apology, but he still has no intention of returning to Lighting Blade. Armia is disappointed but she accepts his answer and says she won't bother him about it anymore. Just then, Mary comes over and she's brought a whole feast to cheer Armia up since she looks like she hasn't been eating well. While Armia is eating, Laos talks with Lyra and asks if there is any way for her to take Armia and leave Margulis party, but if she could have done that she wouldn't have come here in the first place. Laos knows how Margulis treats people, so he suggests that Lyra should lead his party anyway but Lyra refuses to do that since she would be leaving Armia to fend for herself under the leadership of that idiot. The next day, Margulis finally introduces Lyra to Sieg since they will be fighting the Hydra again today, but she seems to recognize him from somewhere, so she wants to have a word with him. She asked what he's doing here and why he is disguising himself, but Sieg is still trying to pretend that he has never met Lyra before so he tries walking away, but as he does so she notices the sword on his back which used to belong to a person named Ronaldo, so she accuses him of stealing it, but Sieg denies it and says it was handed down to him as a gift so he's no thief. He may have cleared his name of theft, but the fact that he admitted knowing Ronaldo lets Lyra know that he is indeed the same Sieg she knew. However, she decides to keep his secret identity hidden, since it seems important to him. Later on in the day, Laust and Narcina are heading into the labyrinth as they usually do, but he can't help but worry about Armia and the rest of Lightning Blade because he has no idea if they are truly ready for the battle or not. The story continues, we see Narcina tears through some works the same way you tear through a bag of Cheetos at 3 a.m. Our blue-haired bombshell of a heroine demonstrates exactly why she's the perfect partner by single-handedly dispatching the entire group of monsters with ease. Laust is impressed, but Narcina already eager for the next challenge. Unfortunately Narcina lost her Ozempic prescription and she's hungry, so the next challenge ends up being lunch. The two find the perfect spot on the dirty dungeon floor, but instead of bringing some packed sandwiches, Narcina surprises Laust with a huge feast. It turns out that Betty Crocker forced them to take the leftovers from earlier, but somehow Laust didn't notice Narcina bringing the giant box of food. As they stuff their face holes, Laust explains what kind of monster his old teammates are up against. The Hydra is a truly terrible foe, with more muscles than a Jojo protagonist, and a body covered in scales strong enough to deflect both physical and magical attacks. As if being indestructible wasn't enough, it's also filled with protagonist killing poison. These dragons are somewhat rare, but among other monsters of its caliber, it's the most common. Thanks to this, the Hydra has been studied extensively by past adventurers, and they have come up with a number of methods in order to deal with it. Its poison will have anyone spraying blood from both ends, like they just ate a Taco Bell taco filled with broken glass, but luckily there's an antidote available for purchase. It's rather expensive however which is why Laust old broken team didn't have one before. Laust explains that his old team will have to rely entirely on their new healer's detoxifying magic. Narcina can't help but feel a little nervous hearing all this, but Laust suits her fears when he describes the kind of people in his old team. Its leader Margulis may look like the free hero you get in mobile games, but he's actually a really exceptional swordsman. As long as he doesn't run for his life and doesn't underestimate his opponent, Margulis can be quite formidable. Laust also knows Siberia that she has top-notch speed and agility. 
Her talent for stealth could be enough to sneak up on any monster, even one with as many heads and eyes as the animators decided to slap onto this thing called a Hydra. Narcina doesn't like hearing Laos speak so highly of his old squad because they dropped him, the same way you guys drop an anime after the first filler episode. However, Laos says that the only language he knows is the truth, so Narcina keeps her opinions to herself now. Instead, she mentions how tired she's getting challenging the same dungeon day after day. Laos agrees that it might be time to move on and Narcina excitedly brings up the wetlands that are not too far away. Meanwhile, in the wetlands not too far away, we join Lightning Sword. They're in the middle of fierce combat with the Hydra that looks like it was solely created remind side characters that they're not main characters. Margulis manages to land a cutting blow against one of the many heads and their latest member Sieg follows that up with a slash of his own that nearly decapitates the beast. Pressing his advantage, the masked swordsman readies another assault, but as his blade reaches the beast, he pulls back and retreats. Margulis angrily calls him out for not finishing the job, but C counters by asking if Margulis would really be alright with him taking all the glory for himself. He believes that Margulis, the trophy man, deserves this trophy for himself. After all, Margulis the Hydra Slayer does have a better ring to it than all his other stupid nicknames. Eager for me to stop making fun of him, Margulis charges headlong at the monster, but he's quickly sent packing after his foolhardy attack. Lyra's busy treating their rogue, but she can't believe that their brain-routed leader is charging straight at the monster. He has no chance because the dragon's basically a walking tank with more blackheads than Siberia's back. Lyra continues to complain, but Siberia says that's just who he is, she likes bad boys and she finds his stupidity rather charming. With her injuries healed and her terrible choice in men, the rogue rushes back to make more poor life choices. Just then Lyra's attention shifts to Sieg who seems to be merely observing from a distance, and she wonders what he's planning. The fight has dragged on for a while now, and the Hydra is beginning to slow down. Siberia's distractions allow Margulis to deal considerable damage, and in this world with no child labor laws, Armia is working overtime with their magical assault. With their powers combined, Lyra is confident that the Hydra will soon fall. Her hopes are shattered when the Hydra sends a huge rock into the chest of the little child labor who now wishes she was assembling Nikes like the other kids. Armia is terrified to see that the monster has now fixed its gaze on her. She lets out a blood-curdling scream as it draws close and things take a dark turn as something strange begins to happen. A dark smoke-like substance begins emanating from her body that no one can identify until Sieg points out that it's fear. As it turns out, Fear is exactly what monsters like to Hydra feed on to grow stronger. What's odd is that fear is not something usually visible to the naked I like this. The team soon realizes that they have been surrounded by the smoke as it flows in from every direction. Lyra shocked to realize that what they are seeing is mana, something only found in the deepest parts of the labyrinth. Mana, fear or whatever this mist is the Hydra absorbs it hungrily and it begins to change. With enough magical power, monsters are capable of mutating something that can often increase their abilities and turn them into even more terrifying opponents. Unfortunately, instead of transforming into something truly creative, the low-budget anime studio just changed its color and throw on some more heads. Still, the beast is several times more powerful than it was before, and Lyra never imagined that she would see a transformation happen in real life. There is no way for Lightning Sword to beat this new and improved monster, so Sieg tells Lyra to take care of the mage and Margulis it is time to retreat. Margulis, the legendary Hydra Slayer does not retreat however, he charges forth once more intent on taking at least one head as his prize, but as his blade makes contact with the Hydra scales, it cracks and snaps in two, completely failing him like the cheap gaming mouse you bought fails you right in the middle of a match. Left defenseless, Margulis nearly finds a new home at the back of the Hydra's throat, but Laust appear to save him just in time. Margulis is shocked to see his old teammate, but there isn't much time to talk. With Narcina's help, the two manage to drive back to Hydra, but Laust is needed somewhere else. Sieg points out that Laust is a mere healer and sends him off to go treat Armia while he holds the beast back. Lyra has used up all her side character points so she can no longer help their fallen mage. Luckily, Laust arrives with plenty of his plot armor tokens, so he uses his humble heal ability on Armia. Lyra exclaims that the basic heal spell won't nearly be enough, but she is stunned to see him use another, and then another heal on top of the. Lyra is confused and wonders if Laust is glitching out as he says heal a bunch of times, but Siberia explains that Laust is just doing what he always does by layering heals. Even the golden boy says that this is pretty common for Laust, but to Lyra, that makes no sense whatsoever. 
Putting a band-aid over an injury helps, but putting 10 band-aid on top of the first doesn't make the wound heal any faster. Fortunately, this not be known at all, it's proven quite wrong when an army reawakens thanks to Laust. Lyra can only wonder just who Laust really is and Armia thanks him for keeping her alive so she won't be fired for leaving work early. Nearby, Sieg has done what he can to hold the Hydra, but it appears that the monster has been waiting for Laust. It's as if it remembers him and now wants revenge. Thankfully, Narsina and Sieg there to help as the three ready themselves for the dangerous fight ahead. The rest stand back and decide to watch from the sidelines while the real heroes go to work. The great Hydra Slayer has no complaints either, but only because his sword is broken, not because he's a coward. The intense fight begins as Narsina lands a stunning punch, and Laos capitalizes on the opening she provides. Meanwhile, Sieg's great sword cleaves a head clean off in a single stroke. Margulis is shocked to see that his blade didn't break, but Lyra explains that it's a magical sword. Margulis is stunned because he has heard of this legendary blade, and it's way better than his pathetic sword that his girlfriend always laughs at. Just then a costly mistake by Narsina sees one of her strikes countered by the Hydra, and she is thrown to the ground. Disturbingly, the monster doesn't attack, but instead seems to take her hostage and dears Laos to fight it one-on-one. -on -one. Lyra comes in with more epic world-building by explaining that monsters don't just get stronger when they mutate into slight variations of themselves, and they get smarter too. This monster now has more intelligence than one head than their entire party, and its heart is full of vengeance. Laust is no punk, so he tells everyone to stay back and he accepts the challenge. Laust dashes forward with the scene quickly cuts to a disappointed old man. When we return to the fight, we see the Laust has been defeated, even though the dragon has a million IQ points, it's still not above flexing on noobs, so it's taunt Laust with a battle cry. Laust just hopes that the dragon won't start teabagging him, and he reaches out to his loyal teammate before losing consciousness. The others tremble in fear as they're out of options, but Laust's body begins to pulse. Everyone is shocked as our hero finds the strength to rise again, this time burning with the terrible aura. It turns out that the mysterious old man was not disappointed by Laust's weakness, he was disappointed that the power inside Laust that should have remained in internal slumber has now awakened. Just then a glowing horn spots from Laust's forehead, as he's infused with the sudden burst of power. The dragon instantly senses the danger, so it moves in to end the fight quickly, but it's too late. With one fell swoop, Laust destroys the Hydra, cutting it down to size before he himself collapses unconscious. When our favorite OP healer awakens, he finds a very worried Narsina leaning over him. Thankfully, Lyra was there to heal him back to health, but she reminded him that such magic doesn't grow on trees, and she'll be sending him her bill later, and it might hurt more than the Hydra. She asked what all that horny business was earlier, but Laos has no clue what she's talking about. Regardless, Laos's old teammates change their attitudes faster than you change clothes after realizing you haven't showered for a week. Margulis is delighted to realize that his good buddy Laust is so strong, and he's convinced that with him at their side, they could even beat the master of the labyrinth himself. Siberia reminds him that no one has even seen the master and says that they should slow down a bit. For the time being, they can sell all the magical stones they gathered after defeating the Hydra. Such a hall split between the three of them is enough to make them all quite rich. Laust points out the more than three people helped, but that's not how the lightning sword operates. Margulis deems that the two newbies on the team hardly did enough to earn a share, and he thinks that it's simply Laust's trophy waifu. Margulis then declares that he, Siberia and Laust can claim the prize for themselves, and even poor Armia isn't included because child labor is cheap anyway. The evil Margulis even goes as far as to suggest that Armia might never wake up, so they might as well just sell her for some extra coin, considering how useless she is as a mage. Narsina quickly fed up with this dark turn of events, so she knocks Margulis off his feet with one solid punch. The fallen trophy case starts whining that guild members are forbidden from fighting each other, and he demands that others testify against Narsina. Naturally, the people he just pissed off didn't see a thing and they have nothing to testify to. Luckily for him, his partner in crime is there to back him up and she says that should let the guild know that they're collaborating to break the law. Sieg has a change of heart and says that he might have seen something after all. However, much so Margulis chagrin he reveals that what he saw was someone trying to human traffic a young girl, Lyra agrees some pervert definitely tried to sell an unconscious person off an evil felony that demands punishment, even in a fictional anime world. Sieg says that he can't let this go, and Margulis is shocked when he hints at what his real identity is. Afterwards, Margulis and Siberia get their just desserts and are tied up, like you are when you're watching anime and your friends want to hang out. 
Sieg takes off his tiny mask that hides absolutely nothing to reveal his true identity, his real name is Zyj, an absolute shocker by the animators. It turns out that he's an adventurer from the Royal Adventurers Guild, which is a pretty big deal. He explains it as part of the Royal Guild, he's there to police other adventurers and to safeguard the town, a job usually meant for local adventurers who have been lacking as of late. When he first arrived to investigate, he immediately ran into Lightning Sword and has been closely watching them ever since behind his perfect disguise. Zaij was completely unrecognizable behind the mask and he witnessed a lot, so it's no surprise that Margulis and Siberia are judged to be unfit for the guild and will be expelled from the association. The two are likely to end up serving a lifetime of forced labor, mopping up baby oil after every ditty party. Their wailing and whining begin, but the two are ignored as Laos says to speak with Zaij in private. Amazingly, he asks that his old teammates be spared for some reason, Laos explains that once those two were good adventurers with dreams and aspirations, but were corrupted by the idea of being the very best. They may crave wealth and social status, but they aren't truly evil just misguided and lost. Laos' speech works way better than mine dose, when trying to get out of a speeding ticket so Zaij agrees and releases the two of them. However, he makes sure that they understand that he might always be watching, and they will never know it because he will be wearing his mask again. The lucky pair doesn't need any more convincing and quickly run off, hopefully right out of this story for good. Zaij explains that even if they had been expelled, they would only go on being their devious selves, trying to human traffic anyone they came across, this way as adventurers the guild can keep an eye on them. However, Amherst isn't so sure about that, keeping tabs on those two might have been easy in the capital city, where high-level adventurers hide their identity using sophisticated disguises, but this is just a small town and they don't have those kinds of resources. Zaij agrees and suggests that he stay a while to make sure that things stay on the level around here. With all that said and done, Narsina isn't feeling the best about what just happened, she regrets convincing Laos to help his former teammates, but Laos isn't worried. He may still have feelings for his team, but he feels good about the way things ended and has no regrets. He actually thanks Narsina and asks her to keep being his partner to which he happily accepts. That night, Zaij and Lyra discuss his true mission. As Zig explains it, he's here to investigate the town in light of all the mutations going on, like the Hydra they just brought down. It turns out that he used another disguise on top of his old one to hide from even the higher-ups. It was a mustache and are practically wiped his existence off the face of the earth. With the information he gathered, he thinks that the Adventures Guild is directly responsible for the mutations, and he even suspects that the boss in charge might be behind it all. He asks Lyra to help him and to form a party together like they did in the old days. Lyra, while hesitant, agrees on one condition, Army of the Mage has to join the party too. Zaij welcomes a new addition and says that he's going to need all the help he can get. Especially now that he has witnessed the kind of monster like Strength Laos displayed in their fight, someone like Laos demands all of their attention. That brings the episode to an end. Thanks for watching. Want next part? Subscribe the channel and turn on notification bell.